Thank you, Dutta. A very eye-opening presentation highlighting the importance of today's seminar. Um, next, we'll be looking at cutting-edge defense measures from, with Dr. Dr. Hussam Kanawi, co-founder and chief scientist of Wedge Networks. He'll be making a 30-minute presentation on Wedge Networks product. Okay, good afternoon. Assalamu alaikum. Uh, Nihao, real pleasure seeing you here today. Um, my name is Hussam. I'm uh, the chief uh, scientist uh, of Wedge Networks. I'm also one of the co-founders. And my role in the company is to ensure that we have a successful delivery of our technology uh, in, in the field. So in a lot of ways, uh, you know, it's one of those cases where usually you're talking to people who know more about products than yourself, right? <laughs> so that's, that's something that I would like to, you know, pay respect to. Uh, you guys out there in the field are the real uh, warriors. You guys are the real, you know, um, uh, you know, fighters of cybersecurity, and, and, and you know it more than we probably do. However, what I would like to do today is that I'd like to go and take you through a quick introduction to my company, speak to you about problem statements, at least get you guys to agree with some of the things we're saying here, and look at some of the ways we're fighting malware um, and our contribution to the industry. Um, so now that we have spoken about that, I would like to actually make some comments to Dr. Abdul Wahab's uh, statements. Uh, first of all, um, one of the charities I, I work with is a charity that uh, develops leaders, and I always tell our kids, guys, listen, don't do drugs, please. Drugs is bad, right? It damages your health. Beyond there is more money in cybersecurity or cyber attacks. You can become a hacker, right? It's much more useful than doing drugs. Actually, from an economic point of view, if you look at 2014, 2014 is the year where there was a crossover between, um, between uh, uh, making money from cyber attacks and making money from drugs. It, it was, it actually, you could make more money becoming a hacker than doing drugs, so go figure. The second thing as well that I'm very uh, impressed, sir, about the, 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 the level of, of preparedness that Malaysia has. I'm also very impressed by, by, by what you guys are doing. And also I'm quite impressed by the level of awareness you have. I mean, the fact that 69% of your people are worried about natural disaster, but 98% are worried about credit card scams. Just goes to show how sophisticated this is. So with that said, you know, this is quickly the, 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 the company here. I'm very honored to have uh, Gary Tate, our, our VP, uh, Asia Pacific. And by the way, he's in neighboring Singapore, so he can always cross the road and, and come and talk to you. Honored to be here also with Dato Arif Siddiqui and gentlemen here about it. Okay. So quickly, that being said, I want to tell you some of the things we have, we have got as awards. So we've been recognized as a cool vendor simply because of the approach we have towards fighting malware. So that being said, let us state some facts. And here are the facts and they're really, really, really. Now why is that happening is because A, we're having now, you know, a lot of new malware. And in fact, right now, there is over a new, one million new variant of malware released on a daily basis. So this simply means this battle is changing and changing dramatically. You can no longer fight it with conventional tools. We now have to bring innovation to the market. And then, let's speak about ransomware. Ransomware, as it's happening right now, it has a simple goal, right? It basically is trying to steal uh, money from you by keeping your information hostage. Is that what we think it's about? I have surprising news for you. Ransomware, before the middle of next year, is going to be much more sophisticated than we think. We're going to see ransomware doing exfiltration. They're no longer going to just encrypt your hardware or your, or your, or your, or your, or your, or your storage because they know you probably have backups. They're going to do even worse. They're going to basically exfiltrate the data before they encrypt it. And then, lo and behold, you have to pay them anyway because right now you can choose not to pay them and you can restore your backups. The second thing, we're going to see ransomware move away from files. I'm, I'm predicting personally that we're going to see ransomware start to use thing, things such as SQL injections, things such as SQL you know, calls to the, so that they can actually put, provide more damage. And then last but not least, if you look at the NotPetya uh, attack we've seen, was it really trying to steal data? 
Is that, is that what they try to do? Actually, no. They actually try to cripple some other, uh, some other infrastructure in, in the country. So we're going to see ransomware being more of a cover. So regardless, it's a real ruthless battle. And for those of you guys who are in the banking industry, healthcare, as that or Arif mentioned, if you're in the government, guess what? There are some people probably out there who are targeting you, who are writing malware that's very specific to you, something that you have not seen or other vendors have not seen. So with that being said, I would like to just put in a state of, state of, the, state of affairs here. Um, as, 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 as Dr. Abdullah have mentioned, we are actually seeing you know, less and less attacks or less and less breaches happening because of these three things, you know, error, misuse, and physical environment. Our, our end users, our system administrators are doing a fantastic job. They really are doing a good job. I mean, like right now, we, cannot no, we can no longer blame them for breaches. Actually, breaches are happening because either it's hacking, it's malware, or it is a socially engineered attack against you. So we have to acknowledge that our system admins, our IT professionals, our CISOs are doing a good job. The fact is, hacking is still happening, right? Breaches are still happening, just because they're getting more sophisticated. In addition to that, if I look at the financial industry, we see the impact in three areas, and these are the areas that are painful, quite frankly, painful. Why is that? They go and impact you in the point of sales. They go and impact you in your web apps, right? Just making your service unavailable. So, so that is the frequency we're seeing. That's why it's, it's, it's becoming painful. Now, one example is the WannaCry. And, and the WannaCry was, was quite severe and, and because it crippled, for example, the, uh, the, uh, the healthcare services in, in the UK. And it was followed by the Airbus, which, uh, which had the record ransom paid in the whole, in the whole, uh, in the whole, in the whole industry to date, uh, where a, an ISP, Korean ISP, paid nearly 400 bitcoins, 397.6 bitcoins, equivalent of a million dollars, just to get their servers back, right? So that is how bad it is. And in addition to that, we are seeing, if I can get this thing, we're seeing that becoming more and more the case because the drivers are there. Let me tell you what I mean by that. First of all, if you wanted to go and become a ransomware author, it's so simple. I can point you to sites that, A, they'll give you ransomware as a service. They will help you de develop the ransomware. They will collect the money for you, and they'll take the cut. They even have, bit, they even have you know, zombie networks to launch the ransomware. It's available. I kid you not. And by the way, get, guess what? For the very cheap price of $400, they'll give you six months support. It's available, if, okay? I mean, that's how bad it is. And in addition to that, we're having ineffective prevention. So it's really, it really is becoming, you know, A on one side, you know, you can become a retail attacker. On the other side, we as professionals are fighting a really losing war. So what do we do? We need to do something different, and we need to become more sophisticated at it now. The problem we have, in, 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 in my opinion, and this is a slide where I'm going to uh, create a lot of probably controversy here, is that we have invested a lot. I mean, like we as companies have invested a lot. We have put firewalls, we have put UTMs, and all of that good stuff. The problem is they're blocking against non-attacks, because how are they blocking? They're blocking using signatures. So. Unless you're very unlucky, and guess what? You're one million times unlucky per day because that's the number of new malware on a daily basis. You're going to see something new. Actually, if you're in the banking industry or if you're a government, someone has probably developed something very tailored for you that no one else would have seen. So that's the problem we have with these products, is that they are blocking previously known malware. Now, we also have, you know, other approaches, you know, for, for detecting new unknown malware, and that is basically, you know, sandboxes. And the good thing about sandboxes is that they're accurate, but they take time, right? They will take their time to tell you that you've been attacked and so on. And again, please remember this number in 20, 2015. I still don't have the numbers for 2016 because it's debatable. We, uh, we saw 431 million new malware, right? That's over a million malware a year. So, in a nutshell, signature and heuristic-based AV are not enough. So, if we look at how we now block, this is the state of the art about how we protect ourselves, we basically have a firewall, and the firewall is typically a next-generation firewall, you know, one of the firewalls available out there. The firewall basically has what's called as packet inspection. It inspects packets, 
tries to block malware. If it doesn't know it, it hasn't seen it before, it could use some kind of cloud-assisted technology or send it out to a cloud, or it could, you, you, could, you could have invested in a sandbox. And the problem is, right now, this is usually too late. You are definitely too late at that time, and, and, and it's, it's, it's done. You're, you're really done at that time. So let me show you, you know, what we believe is, you know, the, just to summarize. Well, whether we like it or not, I don't think we have innovated enough. Meaning that we have, we have continuously, you know, bundled same functions in different ways, right? So whether it's a UTM, where basically it's a bundle of some of these functions here, whether it's the next generation firewall, secure web gateway, secure email gateway, or sandbox, we have continuously did a lot of packaging. But the problem remains right now is that all network products right now are based on what's called as deep packet inspection. We're inspecting based on packets. That's one thing. And the second thing is that the real battle is fought at the endpoint, right? That's where you'd have endpoint solutions and so on. And you might also introduce a sandbox to tell you what your network has passed through. And sandboxes are late. I mean, are, are, are delayed. They give you the response and they give you an accurate response, but after the fact. So in my humble opinion, that is the problem we have in the industry. We have not pushed the boundaries. We have not done much there. So, you know, I'm not the person who is going to go in and complain about what, we, what the industry has not done. And I will basically tell you what we have innovated and what we have done as, as Wedge Networks. First of all, we believe that because of the state of malware, because of the state of compromises happening, there is no way out but to innovate. That's the first thing. And innovation means that you have now to fight malware exactly the same way as malware has been created. Now, if a malware like WannaCry is multi-vectored, because you know how it pro propagated, right? Ma WannaCry propagated using, used a packet-based you know, broadcasting. That's how it propagated, using the SMB vulnerability. Right? That's the first thing. And the second thing, it had a payload, and the payload was unknown, was zero day. So now you have to basically be able to fight malware exactly the same way, like they're bringing up these new techniques. So that's one thing. We have to do that. So from that perspective, we have introduced this platform that allows us to do two things. A, to be able to inspect the traffic exactly the same way as your endpoint will. It's no longer packet inspection. It has to go above and beyond that. It has to be content level inspection. We have to be able to assemble the packets exactly the same way as your endpoint will. We do not need to see just packets because packets do not contain all of the threat information. We need to be able to see PDF files. We need to be able to see MIME objects, PowerPoint, Excel, and so on, and then scan them. So that's the first thing. And the second thing is we now have to be able to scan the content across different engines. We basically, that's what we do. We service chain that. So that is our contribution to the industry, right? We basically produce this, uh, what we call as uh, the wedge, wedge security orchestrator that orchestrates different uh, threat analysis and threat inspections and does that in real time so that we block things before it comes to you. So how do we do that? In a nutshell, this is, this is what I'm going to show you here. We basically go in and we have traffic coming in we have a patented technology called deep uh, content inspection. You can actually check the patent if you wanted to have fun time reading stuff. And what we do, we assemble the content, the packets in real time, and we basically scan it and we send it to different scanners, right? So we use actually the best of breed scanners out in the, the industry. We use the best of breed, breed uh, threat signatures out there and so on. So for example, I'm personally excited about Dr. Abdul Wahab's malware research uh, here in Malaysia because I do believe they have a lot of wealth of, of malware signatures or malware they have seen that we probably could put in our engine. The second thing that's more importantly is being able to provide both packet and content inspection to allow us to, 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 to stop malware this way. And then finally we have what we call as the green streaming. We're able to scan in real time. Meaning that, think of it as follows. Here is your endpoint. It's about to take the content, right? We are actually assembling it in the same time as well as we're delivering it. And then we're scanning it and in real time blocking it. So, in a nutshell, what we have provided to the industry is the ability to stop unknown malware and non malware in real time. So, this is just ba a basic a bit of a commercial thing. I'll talk to you more about what we do here. We have two lines of products called ARP, and one of them basically uh, <laughs> wedges into your network. It's a layer two device that goes in in line and will block things in line before it hits you. Another one that's cloud-based. 
And how we do it is, is, is basically the next orchestration. So we're going to see Floyd, it's basically a layer two device, gets in line and will inspect things in real time. And if you next take me to the next one, please. I'm going to show you how it works. This is, by the way, a simulation of a, of a real, uh, real, uh, real experiment we did. This is a customer that has invested in, in sandboxing technologies as well as a next generation firewall. And lo and behold, this guy went in and he thought he can have a Netflix downloader. Right, because Netflix is such a nice thing. You can watch free movies. So if you can uh, press next, please. He goes in and clicks on the download. Actually, no, he pressed too far, sir. Go back, go back. He, yeah, just once, please. Yeah. So basically, he goes in and he thinks he's going to generate a Netflix account. And guess what's happening? It's not generating a Netflix account for him. Actually, it's encrypting his files. That's a real life experiment we had. And this poor guy basically had his complete machine encrypted. And there was no firewall that could protect him. And even the sandbox could, make, you know, could not respond fast enough. That is basically the reality. Now, how do we solve against this problem as, you know, as, as, as inf information security uh, professionals? We probably have backups of laptops, right? That's what we do right now. We have backups of things so we can remediate that. And so as a result of that, we can quickly see that existing solutions are not helpful. They're not basically kicking in. Why? Because there are zero-day attacks, ransomware, the sandbox did not respond fast enough, all of that good stuff. So if you take me to the next level, right, what we believe in is a solution that should sit in line that's real time and protects you against both known and unknown malware. So if you look at this, if you click on this one, this would be the experience you get if you are protected by our product. You would basically click on it, and lo and behold, it immediately blocks in. It's real-time remediation, real-time blocking of things, both known and unknown. And this, by the way, in this particular case, as you can see, it was an APT. It was detected by the AI engine. So I'm going to tell you more about what we do there. So what we have is we have managed to integrate both signature scanning and signature less scanning in one solution to protect you there. So quickly here, this is what we do and having you next please, yes please. Yeah. So this is what we have. So as I mentioned, please remember attacks are now becoming multi-vectored, right? So your solution has to be multi-vectored too, and that's what we have. So the very first, yeah, please if you can click next. The very first stage in our engine is a packet-based inspection. Why? Because we have to recognize that malware attacks can also happen using a packet broadcast, right? That's just a fact of life. So that's the first thing. If basically we notice that kind of attacks, if you can click, uh, click next, then what we will do is that we'll block it. So we basically scan for non-content non -non -non attacks, we block worms and all of that stuff. The next level of scanning is basically a signature-based scanning. If you can click on that one, please. There, we have the content scanned by different signatures from different signature providers. That's why my company does not compete, you know, with things like Trend Micro, nor does it compete with, with companies like Semantic and so on. We actually cooperate with them. You know, we get signatures from them, we get signatures from different vendors, and we put all of these signatures in our product to scan against the most comprehensive signature list out there. The advantage of these two stages is that I weed out non-malware, right? Because it's a fact of life, some of the attacks will still happen based on non-malware, right? You cannot just basically rely on, on AI alone. The third stage is for heuristics, because guess what? All of those ransomware as a service, guess how they're providing their malware? They're taking non-malware and they're just basically, you know, you know, changing some pieces here and there and giving you that. That's where heuristic at, uh, signature would, would help. And then finally, I have the AI scanner. And AI is where I scan against unknown malware. And I'm going to tell you more about how I do it, because that is, that's where I'm going to spend some, some, some extensive discussions. OK, if I can go next here, please. What is AI? And, 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 and why is it a game changer? Because if you're dealing with one million new malware per day, right, signature scanning is no longer sufficient. That's just a fact of life. It's not going to be sufficient. In fact, if you're also targeted and you have people out there who are tailoring malware for you, again, signature scanning is not going to help you, 
right? Sandboxes will always take time. That's just a fact of life. Why? Because they have to detonate the content. And right now, we have actually malware writers writing malware to evade sandboxes. That's what happens, right? A lot of sandboxing techniques are known to the malware writers, and they'll figure out a way of to, to, of, to overcome it. So, before I go there, I want to basically define what is AI, what is machine learning, and I want to basically put um, you know, a lot of terminology in place because unfortunately we find a lot of confusion about the terminology out there. Now, you all know databases, right? What's a database? It's basically a collection of data. So for example, if I go around this room, take all of your names, your, your, your phone numbers, your email addresses, as well as your, your for example, let's uh, be funny a bit, your ages, then I have a collection of data. I'm storing it in a database. Now, if I go in and start you know, saying, for example, who is above 50, right? I'm one of those, right? I'm old. And then I basically say who is male, right? Who is female and so on. Then I'm starting to have knowledge. Now, if I start counting the number of people who are males, number of people who are females, now we're having what? Statistics, right? Now, if I basically go in and have a program that goes and classifies this data to generate both knowledge and statistics, we call that data mining, right? Now, pattern recognition is where I go in and start recognizing people. Thank you, that's all. I want to make the distinction between machine learning and AI because unfortunately, a lot of people are using these terms interchangeably. And that's something that, quite frankly, can cause a lot of confusion. Machine learning is when the machine is learning to make a decision, right? AI is the known machine has learned and is capable of making a decision. Right? It's like, for example, you know, I take you, I put you through university, then you're learning. When you graduate from university, I expect you to have learned enough to do the job, right? So you're now being intelligent to do the job, right? So that's machine learning and AI. Now, how can we apply this to, 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 uh, to uh, malware or to just knowledge in general? Then I'll go back to malware. Now, let us look at this picture of this young lady here, right? Immediately, I said what? Young lady, right? Does she look like a man? Okay, you were probably all shaking your head saying no. Is she Caucasian? No, right? She is definitely Asian. How did you deduce, did you deduce, how did you deduce that? It's because you saw her eyes, you saw her face, you saw her hair, and you basically said, based on her features, she is a Caucasian, uh, sorry, an Asian lady. That's what you said. So what did you do is that your brain jumped through very quickly and did what's called as a feature extraction and did a, con did a conclusion based on feature extraction. So in machine learning, we have two types of learning. The first one is we call supervised learning, and the second one is we call unsupervised learning. In supervised learning, I basically take the machine and train it against a set of data. So I'd go in and say, okay, Mr. Computer or Computer, here it is, here are all pictures of what a female Asian lady would look like. Here's a picture of what all male Asian ladies would look like, and so on, and then the computer would learn. Now, in the unsupervised learning, I let the computer deduce and then I correct its learning, right? It's exactly like when I take my daughter and try to teach her about birds. I can show her a magpie and say, hey, this is a bird. And then I take a, basically a vulture and say, this is a bird. Take, it, for example, a, 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 an eagle and do the same thing. This is a bird. A chicken, this is a bird, and so on. That's what I'm doing, calling supervised learning. I'm teaching her about birds. Now, if I take a picture of an ostrich, Tell her, and what is this? She would say, Dad, it's a bird. Even though the ostrich has a much longer neck, much bigger feet, and so on. If I show her a picture of a zebra, she would say, not a bird, right? So this is basically the, f the, the phase of unsupervised learning. The whole goal of learning, quite frankly, is to get the computer to program itself based on what is called as a finite state machine. A finite state machine recognizes basically states of the thing and based on features and can reprogram the features and eventually deduce something. That is the whole concept about learning. So in this particular case, 
what is happening is that the machine is learning to recognize the object, right? So, for example, male, female, adult, child, Hispanic, Caucasian, and so on. And the result of which is that it is able to, and probably this is where I have to go back again there, to build a predictive model through which it can deduce. So if you take me to the next slide, please. Right? Now, if I go in and look at malware, how do we do this? How do we do this? And why is this so important? Now, if we have agreed on the fact that signatures are no longer sufficient, because you have a million new malware per day coming out, and some people might tailor malware to you, then the only way to fight malware right now is to have learning. And the way we do it is basically we partnered with a company called Silence, and they have hundreds of millions of, of safe and malicious fine samples. Actually, to be, to be precise, um, as of last month, they had 600, and the new generation, they're actually jumping to nearly, uh, you know, nearly 1 billion files. And then we basically take these files and train it. Train the engine, say, okay, here is malware files, here is clean files, and then we basically leave it to learn its own and do the unsupervised learning. The advantage we have is that now with this kind of power, we are able to detect new malware that has not been seen before based on just features. So what are the features? For example, a feature that could be a portable executable file. It could be a feature that the file is trying to collect data. It could be a feature that the file is trying to hide itself. It could be a feature that's tried to disable function in the registry. All of that fun stuff, right? And based on that, we're able to do so. Now, yes, sir? Aha, uh -huh, very good question. Hold that thought for a second. I'll tell you that in a, in a moment here. Before you go there, I wanted to also finally tell you about the different AI because as, as professionals in your field, you're probably being bombarded by vendors, some like me, talking to you about AI, AI this and AI that and so on. You're going to find there are two types of AI solutions out there in the market. The first one, if you can click the other one, yeah, just, yeah, just let's build it and that's it. The first one is what we call as the behavioral AI. That's what sandboxes do, right? I mean, don't get me wrong, sandboxes themselves have a serious issue because now a lot of people know how to evade them. When you're writing malware, you know how to evade them. I have seen personally with my own two eyes a piece of malware that we caught in the field that the sandbox took nearly 11 hours and still would not converge. Right? I had to send it to different sandbox the writers out there to look at it and tell me what the heck is that. And they said this is probably one of the most sophisticated pieces of battle we've seen because it knows how to evade us quite well. Right? So now they have to start introducing AI. But the difference is that their AI is, is behavioral. Right? They have to put the content in a sandbox which is nothing more than a VM. They have to start simulating in a computer environment to see how the, this malware would behave and then deduce whether it's malware or not. Box, they would go in and imitate a user, you know, clicking on links, right? That's, that's how they, they try to do so. Now, this is exactly the example of I basically take my daughter and let her go and touch an ostrich to deduce whether this is a bird or not, right? She will take time as she goes in and, okay, birdie, birdie, do you have legs, do you have feet, do you have whatever, right? And she'll come and say, okay, this is, an, uh, this is a bird dead. On the other hand, if you basically look at the features and deduce immediately, this is malware, that's what we call a static analysis, right? That's what we do. We predict based on the features. We do not basically play with the features. That's how we use AI, right? And, and the reason we do so is because we have to be snappy, right? We are, really, we are a product that sits in line. We have to give you the verdict in in, in few milliseconds, and that, that's all, right? So that's what we do. Now, if you can take me to the next slide. So, in a nutshell, this is what we do in the learning, right? First of all, learning is learning is learning. What do I mean by that? It's called the universal one learning algorithm, universal approximation theorem as well. So, the beauty of learning is that learning is the same. It basically is the same thing. What does that mean? It means that um, I can teach you to be a concert pianist if I wanted. You just have to have the will to do so. You can do anything. That's the beauty of it. In fact, in an experiment, they took the nervous, the optical nerve of a rat, disconnected it from the brain of the rat, 
and connected it, actually, the, sorry, the other way. They connect, disconnected the auditory one and they connected the eye one in the same place where the rat listens. And guess what? The rat was blind for a while and eventually it teached itself how to listen again and how to see again. That's the beauty of, of, of learning. It's the same algorithm regardless. And the second thing that I would like to summarize here for you is that in programming, you program how to detect. You program how to match. In learning, you program how to see, how to, how to look at features, right? And that's why this signature list scanning is, is extremely powerful, and that's what we use. And by the way, the company we've partnered with is called Science. Now, when we partnered with Science, they told us, good luck, guys. This is a very heavy algorithm. How can you do it in the network layer? And that was our innovation, how to be able to scan in it. Science here. Go back, please. Actually, no. Okay, so this is what we do. We basically have these four stages. And for my dear friend, asking about false positives. That's a brilliant question. That's, what I, that's why I always say, uh, when I'm presenting to security professionals like yourselves, I feel, I feel like the, the, the guy who's presenting to Noah. You know what I mean by that? Do you know the joke? Someone basically died from flooding and went to God and said, God, I have to tell the people of paradise about how bad it is. The flooding was. I died from flooding, God. So I tell them, okay, go ahead, go ahead, present, but please be aware that Prophet Noah is in the audience, right? So there you go, right? I feel I'm presenting to people who are much more aware of these things than I am. In a nutshell, sir, this is what we do to prevent false positives. Now, AI engines would always give you the result based on a model, a mathematical model, right? So it go from plus one to minus one. Anything from zero to one means it's clean. Anything from zero to minus one means it is definitely iffy, right? From our learning, we have seen that anything from zero, so minus 0.6 to, mi to, to minus one is definitely malware. There is no doubt about it. Anywhere between minus 0.5 to minus 0.6, it is iffy. Now, in our case, what we do, we block it anyway. We are very aggressive. We are just, you know, we have, we have zero tolerance. So we, I mean, of course, it's policy-based. You can do that. However, however, there is a reason we have sequenced the engine this way, and we have sequenced the services this way. If you basically start, and actually I have this debate with a lot of people, and this is, by the way, based on a computer science a theoretical model. The question I have, why don't you start with the AI engine first? Right? Why are you taking the hassle of scanning for signature based and so on? It's because I want to increase the chances for the engine to give me a verdict. So if I weed out packet based anomalies, if I weed out signature based anomalies, if I weed out this, then the chances of having a verdict or a verdict that is not based on probable contamination and more accuracy is much higher. Right? However, however, we recognize that we're not perfect. Recognize. So what we do is we have malware analyzer at the end. We use the malware analyzer here, which is a sandbox, for two reasons. Reason number one is to tell you what we have blocked. And reason number two, in some cases, we could have erred on the side of being aggressive. So the way it works is as follows. Here it is. Right, we send the, 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 we block anything anyway, right? We send what we are worried about from the minus 0.5 to minus 0.6 to the, to the sandbox, the malware analyzer. And if it tells us that we erred on the side of, you know, being too aggressive, this was clean content, right? Then at that time, we will basically fingerprint it to avoid that happening again. That's one thing. And we send it to our learning so that we can. For example, in North America, we see this happening typically with some of the Windows downloaders or the Razer downloaders, some kind of downloader of software which has a behavior similar to that. So I'm not telling you that I'm perfect, right? But I'm telling you that I, I'm, I'm working hard to get to that level. And the way I'm working hard to get to that level is that I, after I blocked and protected you, right, I would actually send this as an optional service to a malware analyzer to tell me what, what happened there. Now, in that particular malware, by the way, the, the one that I'm going to tell you, that was from an ancient telco. There was an ancient telco that took our product, they installed it behind a lot of products out there, and we're seeing a lot of malware still. 
And in their particular case, there was a malware that was very wicked, and that's the one that took 11 hours in the sandbox, and it was still not converge. Our engine said it is malware, right? Our AI engine said it's malware. So we sent it to, you know, some, some other analysts in the industry, and they eventually confirmed that it was actually malware. It was written specifically for them, right? But that's what you guys are fighting. You're fighting this kind of battle, right? So my, my approach is, you know, if the AI engine blocks it, I'm, I'm going to block it anyway, unless you basically go in and request a feature, this, this, this policy to be disabled. That's fine. You can do so. But we usually are very aggressive. We block it, and then later on we can correct it based on the malware analysis. Answers the question? Okay, good. Okay, um, so finally, so this is what you get with our product. You get basic nice visualization and so on.